Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the Lasses of Europe in which we're playing as Ulrich's Commissar at Ukraine, but we're not going to stay as them the entire campaign. I guess we have actions we can do here um, in uh, Ukraine. Now I've played as them before and we played as Ulrich's Commissar at Ukraine following their story for Ulrich's Commissar at Ukraine, but we're going to follow the story of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic for this campaign and eventually we'll do the OUN Bandera and the UNRA, but... The Russian Revolution of 1917 was the greatest thing to happen to Eastern Europe in the 20th century, and as thanks to it, Ukraine found itself living through the greatest national communist revolution of our time. From Bukharin's allowance of Ukrainianization programs, to the increased administration of the North Kuban regions, it seems as though the Ukrainian so uh, socialist Soviet Republic had found a relative golden age of peace and prosperity creeping in centralization in Moscow notwithstanding. Now, however, Ukraine lies broke in pillaging and chains, Alexander Shumitsky. Now the factory leader of the USSR seems certain to free Ukraine under the velvet banner of national communism. How will survive afterwards is anyone's guess. And we do have a drink here to keep us uh, uh, satisfied with the monster Ultra Peachy Keen. So we'll see what happens with that. But we still have the breadbasket. We're still trying to do the best we can here. We can mechanize farms. Um, development in the region increases. I like the GDP will increase. We have a lot of areas here, and also we have the whole resistance thing to do as well, but not enough resources to execute. It's fine with us for now. If anything, um, we're going to make sure that even though we're going <laughs> to develop the area a lot more, because I do want the GDP. Don't get me wrong. GDP is still very, 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 very important to me. Um, if, you know, the, so if communists get really influential in certain areas, you know, things happen. Um, where's the best place to increase stuff here? Okay, now put... Uh, you know what? We'll do it in this region. Why not? Because we can. So in the meantime, I'm not going to read a lot of these focuses because I've done it before, but if you want to read these, please go ahead. Uh, fuel the bread basket. I'm going to be bouncing around a whole lot here. Um, just because I want to get to where we want to be. So if you're reading about the father, please go ahead as well. So I believe I have read this before. I've read most of these before. But following the story of the Ukrainian communists is really where we will want to be. Um, so if you want to read about more, please go right ahead. Always more. Uh, if LeBron cares so much for the Slavic degenerates, maybe he'll actually do his job instead of whining. Uh, finish off communal farms. Mechanization of the Nipper. Skip NOC holdings. Ooh. Yeah, I think I read this one last time. So instead of doing this one, as much as I want to improve agriculture, because we increase grain output. We're going to do this one. And I'll actually read this one since we haven't done, I've not read this one or done this one before. Now, I'm going to deny that communal farms discussing vestiges of communist practice, through that, though they may be, are very important to the agricultural sector of Ukraine. Until now, practicality has forced the administration to permit their existence, but no longer. Rex Commissar Kok has made his policy clear and will be enforced. What communal farms remain will be converted, forcibly if needed, into cooperatives along the new models identified. These lands will, shall, and long last be brought into the orthodox standards. So... And I've not also read this one, so that'll keep the deputy busy. Like Brown, for all skills and connections. As a most difficult and tiresome individual, and like some sort of cock is that enough? If the man cannot reasonably be removed or returned to Germania, he can at least be brutasked in a more optimal fashion, and with tasks far from key. The agricultural reforms have been continuing, and who's better to oversee them than such an experienced administrator as such as he? There are so many regional inspections and decisions to be made, and we can still be sure that Lebrant, uh will perform, perform excellently in this, in this captive, capacity. Not captivity, but capacity. So, oh my Ukraine, cast down and beat in her fields, lie follow, her son's blood chokes it, oh my Ukraine. Her oppressors strangle those who love the sap and those who ch wish to happen, cry as it rips out. Their mother's heart and they spill the blood of their brothers, oh my Ukraine, cast down and betrayed, written by Danilo Nosenko in 1962. Uh, more options are here, even though I do want to, you know, keep developing more stuff. Oh, brutal quotas? Uh, we could, or we could save our political power so we can increase our own GDP. So, I'm really focusing a little bit more on production units for civilian factories because I want to build more stuff up. Because deficit's not looking too good right now. So, civilian spending is quite a bit. Of course, I could increase the ta temp tax hike, but it is what it is. Master and servant. Um, if you want to read about this, please go ahead. The servant obeyed. Relieved that the situation did not escalate further. Because poverty is not looking good. Economy is doing, eh. You know. If you want to read about blood from a stone, please go ahead. Uh, partisan control every activity cycle plus point three. Oh, Deputy and Fuhrer, if you want to about him, please, too, please go ahead. Fuhrer Ukraine had to be saved. More money for ninety days. For development every state uh, exploited. It'll get better too. And we'll do that. And there you go. 
The gunman. Well, if you know about the gunman, please go right ahead too. Sustained by the deluge of Ukrainian blood. And the idealist sound out. Um, which I'm going to read because I haven't read this before. For a reference, Herr Lebron, the definition of a cooperator will be provided. It's important as a security against the case you have forgotten, as I know that that thinking about all these funny little deviations from national social thought you have is very arduous, mind destroying work. The cooperators are to operate in a semi collective manner. Unlike the previous models, the plots of land have been have defined owners. The sowing and reaping is generally run collectively, and machinery is commonly owned and used by ten households. It's important that you ensure that administrators do not bungle their work nor permit themselves to be affected by corruption or ideological confusion. They must buy the parcels of land in such a manner as to ensure that we must meet the targets set for us by the Austin Ministerium, Koch. Finishing the letter to the Lebrons and setting it with his usual scribble, Koch smirked a little. That'll fix the specimen quite well, more in time. Spending the realities directed directing agriculture's last time here in Kiev, let near the level levers of power where we can do actual damage. I just hope I also don't screw up the farmers, so. Cool. Um, so if you're about reap the harvest, please go ahead as well. Um, reinforce the strongholds. Finish up the third phase of the GPO. We get stuff here. Uh, support the Jedal Marie. Remind hip diplomats of Hitler's decree. Crack down on termites. Humble the self righteous Prussian. The committee in Ark Rasp. This is not enough. And a visit for all time's sake. Which would be quite nice. A purpose unending. Outside of Kharkiv, there was a sorrowful grouping of dilapidated factories, empty and deemed hazardous and unusable by the German authorities. Most of its workers were dead. Killed by the many famines the city had experienced. Fell out west or into the swamps or simply went as most did into the hollow and emaciated ruins of the city. Anything useful had been pilfered, leaving the rest of rust and crumble. To be viewed only from a distance is yet another meaningless ruin amongst what was once a bustling metropolis. Within these snow-covered structures, where it must have been... Thus, the smell and the empty coldness of a tomb was a sight lay the remnants, the last remnant of the Ukrainian Social Soviet Republic. Alexander Shuminsky's face was only illuminated by a single gas lamp, while his office of iron sheets and curtains remained dark and obscure. Shuminsky's eyes slowly moved to the next paper in his pile he missed music. That would make it better. In living this dungeon and lightening the rhythmic, rhythm, uh, rhythmless drudgery, Shuminsky picked up yet another paper a report. Scenes of devastation, charred bodies, crushed skulls, burning homes, and burned churches. A retaliation expedition, the report said. Shuminsky, Shuminsky had seen it all, not just in pictures. He hated to admit it. But he thought it all still now, women and children, even that note could not break his heart any further. What if the raid had been prompted this massacre accomplished? A few rifles and boxes of bullets already at the cost of ten men. Shimsky felt his surroundings grow colder. This couldn't go on. Recruitment was non-existent, and the younger generation cared more for the next handful of bread than freedom. No. Shimsky straightened. The raid may have ended in a massacre, but that only proved that if their operation or oppression continued, death would be their fate. Those men had undoubted Bane. Those bullets would pierce the brains of the murderers of their countrymen. Shimsky was all sure of that as he ever was. All we have now is... Hope to never lose again a generation. Laying down her hopes down to some sort of collapse is the exact line of thought which lost us Filkov and Petrovich and countless other young men. The Reich is as strong as ever. The units are replenished regularly and we can't even harass supply lines anymore. Uh, Mixim Gornichuk thought the meeting was going swimmingly until, as it, as, as it hadn't already ended with most of the, most in the room want, seemed to want. We have nothing then. We can't feed our troops. Defections are rising. The people don't even speak Ukrainian. There's no national feeling at all, it seems. Much less class consciousness. Reading is the only thing that excites men. Probably because all your men are common murderers and bandits wearing old uniforms. That's enough, Gordon the Chuck stood above the other commanders who all immediately yielded. We all know our failures. We stare at them in the face daily. How many countless times do I wish Filkov had lived and not ordered him to raid Kharkiv? Those photos of Petrovich dangling from a tree still haunt me. We've all made mistakes. That is the only thing I know, surely. Our failure hangs over every village we plunder for a few chickens while the whole nation starve. It hangs over every city ruined, ringed by ruins. It hangs over the graves of men we ordered to their deaths. It hangs over me, heavier and heavier with each passing moment. The whole room was not silent now. Not a man averted their gaze from Konichuk's steely visage. Not a man disagreed. We have what we have. I've talked to peasants. who view themselves not as Ukrainians or even Russians, but simply as residents of farms. I have conversed with factory workers who don't even remember Soviet times who believe that every word of Hitler I propaganda. I shall not lie, the situation is bleaker, bleaker than you know, however we still fight, and we'll continue to fight for Ukraine will never live unless we do. Gordonichuk sunk into his chair, the room returned to a slight dim as each commander routed off possible strategies. The meeting ended with each man leaving one by one, the cause bloody yet, but just as necessary. So now our leader George Cock is dead, Jorg Lebrant is in power, but we have the longest war. For decades, the Nazi, boundless in his brutality, had been crushing Ukraine underfoot. For those same decades, the dedicated partisans of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic has been fighting them. Through setbacks, deaths, and campaigns of all terror, all we endure, we thrive. The Republic is still the strongest single force resisting the Reichs Commissariat and their collaborators, and holds high the flag of the eternal revolution. We cannot lose, for if we do, Ukraine is lost. We will die. Before that happens, we will make sure doubly so that the Germans die as well. 
The call of freedom. In our hearts, we all know that Ukrainian people are still communists, but the recent years have also been hard, with the setbacks suffered. We also know that many, even most of them, have given up hope. We must act to change this. To show them that we remain and the Ukraine is not lost. We'll reach out in print and voice and remind them that the freedom from Germany tyranny is possible and even probable if they support us. The Ukrainian Red Army is the most powerful force in the country fighting for them. If, and if only they'll join us, we can achieve victory. It'd be great. Um, if you're wondering about partisan activity skyrockets, please go right ahead. Oh boy. And a marriage request. Um, I'm gonna, or I'm going to fight for it anyway. If you know about this, please go right ahead. I've read this before. and That uh, does not concern us because we are, uh, well, we're red. We're very red here. For now. Until we're not. The Call of Freedom, yes. What is this? Oh, good. Ah, 75% chance of Ukrainian Red Army in control in Hugensworth. Ah. So we don't care about this crap anymore. Development. And don't get me wrong, I would love to have more development here. The ruling government does not have majority control over Hugendorf's. Ah. Disrupt a resource extraction. Steel machinery. Development is impeded. State GDP goes down. I don't necessarily want to do that. I don't want to lower the state GDP and whatnot. We can close out of action. Stock oh, stockpiles. We use our resistance group stockpile to execute actions of the breadbasket. Any resources we do not use here will be utilized at the start of the uprising. Oh, interesting. Here, potentially more control. Disrupt infrastructure. We lose a little bit of manpower and weapons. Probably get more control. And attack occupiers. That well, decreases population. 80% chance of increasing our Ukrainian Red Army control in Hickensdorf. Desolation might increase. By quite a bit. Or we actually might lose control here, too. Um, desolation. So, development we don't really care about too much. So weekly change, 100 guns, 300 manpower. That's not bad. Uh, what is this? Oldendorf, Alta Oldendorf, what is this? The following states are all decisive regions of the RKU. Okay. So that's the region operates with the group's base of operations. The severity of a group's actions are determined by whether the group's control over their decisive region is over their control. The threshold is not. In the case of the RKU, SS, and police, where multiple decisive regions are at play, the sum of the control will be compared to the control threshold. Looking pretty good. So you know what? We're going to save here. If something bad happens, obviously I want to be good, but we're going to save regardless. Because I want to make sure what we do is successful in the end. Like this one, it's going to cost us a lot. I would like to get 5% more control. We lost control. And that's why I made saves, just in case. As uh, we're going to read about the Red Vitalinus. But first... Ooh, change in manpower. The cause we're dying for. In the land known as the Ukraine, there's but one cause, only one cause we're dying for ours. We are those that have kept the light alive, that noble flame which Lenin, Shakrai, and Skripnik lit and died to keep it lit. In our hands we hold the dream of emancipating the worker and peasant from the oppression of capital, renewing the long oppressed culture and nationality of the Ukrainian people and transitioning therefrom to a communist society. Sensible Ukrainians know, know to neglect the other option in this country as unworthy of consideration. Horlis merely promises to hold a Ukrainian whip over Ukrainian workers' heads. Klaichivsky uh, sells Ukraine more senseless death and destruction and causes national salvation, and the Germans have only ever promised one thing, slavery and starvation. What response we have to all this, but repeat once more. Povstanyeta prokliati osyudi arise you wretched of the earth, and the dissemination of free Marxist thoughts, the cornerstone of any revolution is the motivation of the revolutionary. That is why instead of focusing on the failures of the past, we must instead focus on inspiring the proletariat to break the chains of Nazi rule. We shall spread Marx's theories in hopes of the free socialist Ukraine where all can live side by side, where no pension person is denied food or shelter, where the means of production are owned by the workers. Winning over the general population will be a great boon to the socialist cause. The toiling peasantry and factory workers will hear stories of a great stateless society that awaits them if they join the righteous revolution. The suffering of the people of the East will surely flock to our ranks once they hear of the bright future that awaits them in a free, communist Ukraine and the red vinylist. Um, for a man to stay in a union house past midday was nearly suicidal. It was especially difficult to do that in Donetsk any time past sunrise. Yet here was Vasil at was. Playing away at his violin like it would have been the Grand National Opera. Playing away in the little apartment was incredibly risky. Vasil knew that, and his friends with him especially knew that. Playing a slower rendition of Dance of the Nights, Vasil thought back to his tutor back when the world made some semblance of sense. It was maddening that the world had practically ended, and all Vasil could do was survive it. Yet moments, moments like these kept him calm, calmer at least. Looking at those around him, they weren't half as calm. The aura beyond the music was very clear that they could be rendered by a German raid at any instant. 
The seal was nearly halfway through the song, and everyone could feel it. The moon shifted. The emotions changed. There wasn't any traffic outside. The chatter outside the apartment calmed disturbingly fast, like the world was about to end, and in a sense it was. The steps outside in the hall hadn't diminished. If anything, they got less hectic and heavier. You could almost hear a pin drop if it weren't for the violin, and the German's knives being sharpened. They still took a breath. As friends took their handguns and machine guns out from under the coats or the suitcases and pointed them at the closed blinds or locked doors, almost sapped them mightily. The seal still played, and yet, you get a bizarre feeling. He wouldn't be able to finish a song. He grew tense, primed, but he couldn't shake the feeling. He wondered if he should even finish a song, but he knew he had to, so he wondered. Should he play it here shorter, his own version, but writing a crescendo in his own way? He contemplated, let's do the crescendo. Hero of the Union. Lumilla's Balachenko's first sensation was not a, a pain, but a cold numbness that began in her forearm and trickled its way past her wrist and towards her trigger finger. It felt to her like someone had pressed a wasp into her skin, as if, be heartbeat by heartbeat, something was pumping venom deeper into her veins. She allowed herself a moment to look out of the scope of her sniper rifle to her arm to only find, oh, she said with perfect, casual perfect casualness, her arm had a hole in it. And though wrapped her flesh and severed a bone, she could only see the blue sky of the perfect morning. She marveled at the strangeness of it before throwing herself under Snapper's perch. Several large cracks echoed throughout the air above as she fell through tree branches and brambles. Tumbling, she was aware of the world becoming a light over comrades shouting cries of fear and surprise of Hitlerites advancing through the forest. Plans of an assault melted away, replaced in an instant with a dark realization. So when it talked, the Germans had preempted her squad's surprise assault with one of their own. There was a loud, unnatural crunch as she hit the ground. There was no moment to hesitate. She forced herself again to her feet against a tree. She attempted to grab the small pistol from her side holster. She watched as the muscles in her arm only spasmed and contracted, but the arms hung useless at her side. The only feeling was of a cold, constant numbness. Crap, she whispered. She reached across her body and fumbled with the gun. Crap. Three times. L Ludmilla Balachenko, killer of Nazis, hero of the long-dead Soviet Union, found herself fleeing through the forest like a wounded animal. Her only thought was of her husband and her promise to him to fight the Hitlerites into her last breath. Painful memories. Limited omniscience. Welcome, gentlemen. I wish it was better... Uh, better if we were better under better circumstances, but the Bolsheviks have seen fit to evolve their tactics against us. The police chief opened to the crowd of police officers, paid close attention, because your life might literally depend on it. One of the officers in the crowd, Alexander, resisted the urge to smile. The so-called Ukrainian workers and peasants' red armies but managed to get its hand under printing press. The chief continued, holding up some papers, they have been mass printing documents detailing how to build weapons, explosives, and tools of sabotage. They're also detailing the optimal ways to assault officer patrols, sabotage infrastructure, and disrupt operations. The chief continued reviewing the pamphlets, knowing that while most distance would be incapable, the instructions were genuine and in the wrong hands it could even cause damage, Alexander did derive some gratification from knowing that the Germans were taking their work seriously. In response to the growing threat, there are some things to, you, to keep in mind, the chief said, closing up the brief. First, do not deviate from your patrols. Keep your radios on at all times and use them when reporting suspicious activity. If you see something, report it. Mostly fear-mongering with a uh, standard law enforcement doctrine. Alexander was almost disappointed by how little effort the Germans were putting in. Granted, he had managed to infiltrate the ranks, so their methods were already suspect, but almost none of it was being suggested his life-saving would have any impact. Well, he certainly wasn't going to complain. He didn't think his comrades would either. Well, for the rest of the Rex Commissario was just as exploitable. A young hero. Where do you think you're going, Hor? Kia bit back a curse as he instinctively ducked into the mouth of a nearby alleyway. Uh, there is one before. Um... Well, if you want to read about this, please go ahead. I think I've read this one before, so... So we started hatching a plan. We're just all doing the dissemination of free Marxist thought, the cause we're dying for, and chaos in the end of my life. Despite the state's best efforts, banditry continues to increase across Ukraine, where there's, of course, a massive increase in the general level of chaotic activity. The current force, focus of the security forces, is the Mykolov region. They are the force of the USSR, UASSR. A mockery of there ever was was one, has risen. And are far more organized than any of the administration previously thought. Local security commanders have, of course, taken action, and reprisals against the bandits have increased tenfold. This has been responded to by a number of assaults upon our garrisons, ambushes, upon our patrols, and other crimes on the bandits' part. Given the surprising intensity of the conflict, it is yet not clear whether the bandits are, uh, or our security forces will emerge victorious. We can only hope for the former. The alternative of Kura would spell disaster for any stabilization efforts in the, in the future. For the sake of the Rex Commissar, that we hope that doesn't happen. Reich Ausstadt. Down here. So 60% for us. Ah, they actually did hurt us. Darn it. Um, we're going to save again just because I want to make sure we get this right. It's almost August. So, so Hugensdorf is looking pretty good for a red Ukraine. As it should. We do better? Oh, we can. Nice. We're going to definitely make sure this is almost like over 90% of our control. Nice. Nice. 80%. That is fantastic. Really make sure that this area is definitely under control. Yearly deficit, growth, who cares? 
You know what? Uh, civilian austerity. Eh, people still matter, but I guess. But still. Happy August, everybody. How much caffeine does this drink actually have? Oh, 110 milligrams per... Yeah, that's not much. Looking for the past. If you're new to this, please go ahead, too. I remember this one now, finally. Uh, we could actually use more grid power, huh? That is not good. There's a reason. There might be a reason why I'm putting a lot of things in here. Um, nuclear reactor. We don't have that. We have a dockyard. Well, roads are 6,000. I'm not sure if we'll have enough time to actually get this in there. Can we actually install this? By October? Oh, we'll try. Why not? The cost of war. Hey, darling, how have you been? Oh, the kids are doing fine. Don't worry. Yarim is going to be such a good little boy. Remember, Marizia and Andre are neighbors. Uh, they're going to have a baby. It's such good news, right, darling? Yaroslava Dobrovich. Dobrovich stood in front of the clean and tidy grave of her husband, Volodymyr, talking like her beloved one was still here, hoping to hear something, yet always knowing that the response wasn't coming. They knew each other since middle school, and right then it already seemed that they're happy, long... Uh, uh, family life was just destiny. Then the war began. And the Nazis crushed all their hopes. Volodymyr, just like thousands across the country, refused to give up. He joined the Soviet resistance and carried on the struggle, but he didn't leave to see his dream come true. A Wehrmacht soldier shot him down in the last months of the West Russian War. Just the thought of it hurt Yaroslava like a bullet in the head. She could still see him, smiling, going right into the hands of death. She could still hear him promising that everything would be fine and he would return. She could still remember his body hanging in the central square with a sign, Bandit. Now, the eldest son would make the same mistake. No matter how hard she tried to convince Yorima not to send himself to a certain death, he only lent partial attention. He wanted to avenge his father. His rage burned so hot that he couldn't see the truth. The Germans would find him. They would torture him, they would kill him, and all the struggle would be in vain, and all the pain would come again. Tears started dropping down to the ground near the grave plate. She couldn't let him die, but she couldn't stop him. She slowly started to go home, with the thoughts that tomorrow she'd have to clean the grave again. It was getting late anyways. Another uprising, another family member forced to fight a never-ending war. And the man to see it through. There's not a loyal socialist in Ukraine who does not know the name Alexander Shumsky, and with good reason. Oh, um, uh, if you want to read about this, please go ahead, too. Oh, uh, oh, maybe I do this one. Oh. Let me go read that too. The old uh, fighter had led the movement for years, ever since the turbulent times of the early 50s. And his encouragement of all of and support for the consensus based government within the Communist Party won him not but praise. As many others support him entirely, and his vision, commitment, and skills cannot be underestimated. He is a man who will lead us to victory over the hated Nazi. He is a man who will be our liberator. With Shumsky, the revolution will defeat the fascist occupiers and send them fleeing back to Germany. Where are the men these days? Where are the. Bellatora is ready to fight for our nation. Artyom's friends have been tolerating his foolish talk for the past hour now. The liquor made it easy to ignore him. Apart from Artyom, they were all in agreement that this rendezvous at Constantine's Halval was to drown their sorrows, not to lament for a future that would never come. Artyom, these men died long before we were ever born. Constantine's speech was slurred and weary. Please spare us from this bravado. We all know what happens to those who resist. Artyom remain on phase as we continue. I'd rather live a day as a lion than continue to slave away as a sheep. Those communists in Russia have my respect. The room collectively tried to drown him out with more booze, yet he kept going. Everyone else in Europe seemed content to let Germany walk over them. They were only the ones fighting back. Drinks and jokes continued among friends while Altim continued his recruiting drive for the resistance until dawn came as a reprieve for the, their moribund lives ended. No one took him up on his call to arms, but Artim knew in his heart that his words had not fallen on deaf ears. At least, that's what he had hoped. But more than the only person he had convinced was himself. Huh. Seems like a while. Questions of the unknown. Even with that, please go ahead. Here are the Union women on the run. Ludmila Palachenko, the most decorated sniper of the former Soviet Union, did not know how long she'd run after she fought the firefight. Her memory was a blur of branches, uh, and her own ragged breathing of stumbling through the deserted towns and villages with her useless arm dangling beside her. She was sure that the Hitlerites would soon be upon her. It was only when she arrived in Donetsk, and she was able to get herself in front of a doctor, a patriot, but too young to have any real credentials, and she, that, could she, that, that she could think clearly again, and being able to think was an awful thing. I don't know what to do now, she said. She was walking along the city's shoreline, her pus-stained bandage arm looped in front of her beneath her coat. I feel useless. Her friend, the doctor, gave her a curious smile. A curious smile. Oh, well, I hope you aren't planning on doing anything that would waste all the supplies I used for your treatment. There was a pause. She stared out at the sea. I'm sorry, that was a poor joke. When my husband, Ketenko, died. I made a promise that I would destroy the Hitlerites before my dying breath. Until my dying breath. For so long, I made good on that promise. I became a sniper. I became good at it. I felt like I was doing something for the future now. She attempted to squeeze her bandaged hand. She found the movement. What do I do? Go back to the kitchen? Play the role of good housewife until the Nazis kill us all? The doctor said nothing for a long time. She wondered if it was old enough to remember anything about the Union or if he had thought of it like a fairy tale ki uh, kingdom, a dream of ages long past. Ludmilla, I can't promise you all, you'll ever be a good sniper as you were, but I don't think you'll ever stop fighting, even if it seems impossible. You're too stubborn to give up. 
If you turn to see him give a weak smile, do what you can. It's always worth to fight those who will inherit the earth long after we're gone. They remained for a while. Donetsk was not a beautiful city, but it was enough. Uh, the outbreak of the Civil War, 15 forts will be raised in the city of Hugensdorf. And people come. Well, there is a fortress during the Rus Russian War. As Yegorov and Tukhachevsky's troops surged over the AA line, we too launched our own offensive. Much like theirs, we nearly succeeded at top of the Nazi monstrosity, but met failure. Thousands of brave, strong young men and hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians would meet their end at the cruel hands of the Wehrmacht and SS, and they were driven, we were driven, from our previous strongholds in central and western Ukraine. It was only by the quick thinking of Shumsky and Konachuk that would save us from an annihilation and a great retreat to defensible areas in the Donbass and Kharkiv regions, which can only stand as their main operating areas within the Rex Commissariat, without which we would soon wither. <clears throat> However, not all is well. Even excluding the Nazi presence, our strong Ukrainianization policy has continued under uncertainty. I've generated no small resentment among the Russian minorities, swollen by the inclusion of the various Russian lands within the Reichskommissariat's territory. It's necessary to eradicate this potential fifth column. Just before it spirals into catastrophe, the party just disagrees on how. A picture is a resolution. If you about that, please go ahead. The battle is Ittomir. Perhaps nowhere else in the country is more reflective of the anarchy than Zietomir. There, nearly every flavor of bandit clashes with both state security forces as well as each other. RK, UNRA, UPA, UISSR, all are present in great numbers, and casualties among all the sides increased by the day. So too does the intensity of violence. Bandits, of course, know no limit on brutality, and security forces are required to not only respond in kind, but all escalate, too. The cycles have continued for some time, despite the shock and atrocities inflicted upon the population by the so-called freedom fighters. There appears to be no end in sight. Many claim uh, that... Uh, that the Rex Commissariat is on the verge of collapse, but it's a fighting here. In the most volatile region of shows, state security forces remain commitment, committed to protecting the integrity of the administration. Reinforcements have been dispatched, uh, and support to the garrisons has increased, but as of yet, none can say whether such aid will prove decisive. It is hard to do as to do so. We must wait for the final reports, and hope that order emerges. It depends on who has the order. I love Rick and Hero, the Union Woman of the Book. Lyudmila Pavlichenko, uh, once the greatest sniper in the former Soviet Union, served at the blank page, then in the dull gray sky outside, through visible uh, through the window of her Amshakal Donetsk apartment, then back at the page. Heat radiated from her cheeks, even though she had once attended Kiev University with the dreams of becoming a uh, teacher, of being a historian, she returning to journaling felt like a step backward. She got up from her chair and circled like a fox looking for traps. Uh, why was she doing this? Because her doctor friend had told her that writing might give her some relief? That uh, putting her thoughts on paper might prove some distraction from the Hitler riots as they had made a ruin of her homeland? That it might make her feel less useless when the pain prickled through her mangled arm, a reminder of her broken pact and dashed ambitions? What a pathetic thing to do. She might as well pick up cross-stitching like some pathetic cow-eyed bourgeois woman waiting for her husband to return home from fighting. She gripped her chair tight with a wanton working hand. She breathed in and out, then counting each exhale she once done from the safety of her crow's nest, she released her grip. There were, of course, men who kept track of their thoughts and actions. Gramsci had written, even as he rotted in prison, Lenin had too, as his body failed him. Countless Soviet generals had shared their stories after the war. Was she so haughtily as to believe herself superior to all of them? Why was she regurgitating old, oppressive myths about what was and was not womanly? She forced herself to sit back down and pick up a pen. Even as her brain screamed about how stilted the prose was and how shallow her thoughts were, she made herself keep writing. Whether they be a Russian, Ukrainian, Tatar, or Jew, all people have a place in the Ukraine made free under the Soviet Union. All are welcome. Um, eastward flight. A trustworthy swine. Oh, if you know about this, please go ahead. Very nice. All right. Oh, look at this. Now we have no ability to control this area, unfortunately. This is looking very good. Um, that's why I saved. So we don't have that area. We have literally no presence in eastern Ukraine. Western Ukraine, I mean. But we'll continue to build ourselves up here. And see if this will do well for us. Hey. I want at least 90%. There you go. So we're done with this area here. This is uh, and naturally fully under our control. Which is great. But, uh, what do we have here? A firm reminder. Ooh, we have expanded to expand Ukrainianization in our eastern-based territory. Versus a group of compromise. Decided to compromise the Russian-speaking minority in our eastern-based territory. If you want to do this, please go ahead. We're going to go with a firm reminder. An unfortunate legacy of centuries of Russian imperial rule is a continued prevalence of the Russian language and the preference to the Ukrainian one, particularly in the east of the country. While Ukrainianization allowed us to begin to solve the problem before the invasion, it proceeded very sluggishly. Moreover, the Germans, despite their alliance with the OU and traitor reactionaries, have done nothing to change this. The occupation has made things very difficult, but there's a single sl silver lining. We're no longer bound to maintain the interest of the Russophile minority position in the east. Let us make clear that if we successfully throw Cox and Abomination down, 
They had Ukrainization will return in full force. We do not care what remnants of Stalin's cultists and Tiumen or elsewhere have to say about it. Let them hold their little peace talks, since their failure put us here in the first place. Here are the woman. Woman on the rise. There's not a thing for Ludmilla Pavlovchenko to be dressed in her best fatigues in a dark warehouse on the outskirts of Donetsk. With a fragile arm, only barely able to stand or bend, she felt like a porcelain doll about ready to be packed into a box and shipped off. Still, she stood firm and at attention in a darkened room as a man in ratty uniform sat in front of her burning through cigarettes. Ooh. Oh god. Um, if you want to bet this, please go ahead. Ludmila Pavlovchenko, he said. He let the name hang in the air like an incantation. You've been out of combat for some time, haven't you? I was shot, Comrade General. She moved her arm delicately, still half afraid of my shattered from too much movement. I got treated. I waited for the Hitlerites to lose my trail. I started riding and doing what I could do to mobilize the party in Kharkiv. She said, as a matter of fact, as if the last duty had not been forced on her. And after she started writing her journal, something that she'd taken to mockingly describing as her repentance, her doctor friend had even insisted she circulate her thoughts in the underground papers. Even if the words weren't perfect, he whispered in his high, boyish voice, what better way to inspire the people than to let them know that Lady Death still lived? That she not only continued to fight, but she remained true to the Soviet Union? Truly would give new life into the resistance she had insisted. I read one of your articles. It wasn't terrible. The general flicked his cigarette into a flow overflowing ashtray, then looked at her. The people in charge would like to offer you a promotion. It's not going to come with a pay or fancy uniform, but it'll put you at the center of resistance. He let smoke through escape through his nostrils, and the center of the danger. Ludmilla kept her face passive. I will accept any duty to support any duty for the motherland, Comrade General. The man gave a wry smile. Welcome, Comrade General uh, Pavlachenko. Or Pavlachenko, I should say. So, I'm glad we did all this stuff here to make sure this is really firmly under us, because now they have more control here. 16%, full control is not good, 95%, we're going to attack up here next. We get Chernigal. At least that's how the Germans would pronounce it. Uh, aftermath. And if you're about the Aftermath, please go ahead. Good. Oh no, they can't meet the, res the grain res shipments. Splitters. Oh. Roman Ospojovic. Oh, Rozdolski nodded to the guard by the door. Stepping into the building that a lifetime ago might have been a Atatka. Rotten water damage scarred the walls and he could still feel the floor creaking beneath his feet. Places like these carried their own sort of risk, but then men like Rozdolski have been running such risk for over 20 years. Not much of a getaway, is it, comrade Rozdolski, said the man. There were lines etched on his face, the look of someone who hadn't had a good night of sleep in years. Kind of like me. Rozdolski knew that better than most. He had the privilege of meeting Alexander Ostrzymski, and he respected the man immensely. You could have picked a better spot, Comrade Ostrzymski. Rozdolski de Pand. They shook hands. It's good to see you. You too, uh, Comrade Rozdolski. Ostrzymski agreed. It's been a while. So what do you need from our vision of Trotsky? He asked jokingly. He used to such thing, think such things as ideological differences were matters just short of life and death. Funny what a war does to a man. Ever the comedian. He had chuckled before turning serious. He was pacing around the room. The Germans are in disorder. The grip on this country has been weaker for years. Sooner or later, it'll be weak enough that the people will see the rotten structure for what it is. We can't afford a division when that happens, comrade. Not if we want to have a chance of winning. We need the people's support, and we need unity. That's easier said than done, comrade Shumsky, he said pointedly. Of course, of course, but that's why I have you here. Comrade Orozdolsky, there was a gleam in his eye. You can talk to your people, your comrades. If they don't give in, then send them to me. We can shoot each other over ideology after we're done with the fascists and the reactionaries. Until then, we are all good socialists. Hope springs eternal. How many more days we got? Eight days. Nice. Somewhere in eastern Ukraine, they have forced. Up a black spot on German maps, they swallowed anything that dared to enter it, which of course was the whole point. In the belly of the Great Beast lay a command post for the Communist Party of Ukraine, its chairman inside its office with nothing for, but company, for company but memories. Through a release from the chains of capitalism, the Ukrainian nation that once suffered so greatly under the Tsars has finally experienced its cultural rebirth. We may soon be able to stand not as a servant to the foreign empire, but as equals in a shared common struggle with Russia. It was 1919, and the role was once again so bright as a young Shumsky spoke to crowds with a revolutionary zeal. It was 1962, and older Shumsky gazed back at his youth, his face speckled with hardship, but her lily with the marks of a life's struggle yet inside him. The spark of 1919 burnt brightly, an unbreakable spirit that would not let him lay down and capitulate to fascism. A fire is at deep within him, and one that would not be quenched until Ukraine is free from German stranglehold and promises that the Lenin could be enacted. Those that succeeded the hopeless despair justify the collaboration with pitiful excuses. Shumsky knew that he could only meant for them. He could hold, only hold his torch higher. The work of a revolutionary was never finished. Memories would have to wait. The iron was hot and their time had come again. The Ukrainian workers would wake from their slumber once more. Their dawn inched closer every day. From a minor too. Our southwestern refuge. Following our failures in the West Russian war against the fascists, many of our comrades and party leadership fled from the German-occupied majority of Ukraine to the Romanian-occupied Odessa. Time and distance, self made organizing with them difficult, still at the time of insurrection and revolutions approaching, and securing our influence along the Commissariat border borders vital for our success. With this in mind, we need to organize our uh, uh, resources and manpower in Odessa and coordinate with our old comrades like Pesotsky, 
Orozdolsky and Pokrten. Once we secure our footholds, we can expand our influence and use Odessa as a springboard for anti-fascist struggles. Carry on. Ukrainian Godzar tradition is something truly unique and incomparable. It survived the centuries of repressions, outlived republics and monarchies, and even seen wars, even now. Despite all German efforts and attempts to finish off the remnants of Ukrainian culture, Kobzar Slavon, but unfortunately one of their path, life paths was about to end. Vasil Logan was laying on his deathbed, moments away from seeing God. Memories were flooding in his consciousness. His life was flashing before his eyes with him. Was his only remaining relative, his grandnephew, who couldn't see him for blindness, yet he could still hear his voice. It warmed his soul during these final moments. Everyone else knew he loved him. He knew and loved was already 1600. The Germans already got them. His nephew was only hope. With no one else to pass on his legacy, Vasil knew what he had to do. Petro Vasil's silent voice filled the hut. He was too weak to even speak properly, but he tried his best, for he knew he must. I want to pass to you something valuable to me. Take my Vandura, Petra, and carry on my legacy. Carry on the legacy of Kobzars. Carry on a culture. Carry it on. Petro, always near his uncle, heard his last words. He knew how important his Bandura was to him, and sometimes he thought his uncle valued it more than his own life, which was actually not far from the truth. Not a single thought uh, of saying no appeared in his mind, not even a single doubt. His tears began flowing from his eyes. He said only two words, yes, uncle. He would, just like his uncle, until his death. So now, so 83% is not bad. So we're going to work on this area next. Yeah, even more manpower would be great. Volnian, Volnian. They can fight each other for that region. It's fine with us. Whatever. Blue and red. The hammer and sickle of the Ukrainian Social Soviet Republic. Adorn the room. Its edges fray. The fabric worn. The colors faded. Yet there was. It hung as if in defiance of the forces that tried to ferociously destroy it. And they succeeded almost. Andrei Orchit. Needed no reminder of the fascist march across the Union, of the titanic bloody campaigns across a hundred battlefields and thousands of kilometers. They had fought, the Red Army of Workers and Peasants had fought, the people had fought, the Union had fought, and they lost. Today the Germans ruled Ukraine as they have for 20 years, exploiting the nation's bounty and its people to feed their murderous empire, nothing more than a colony to be squeezed and manipulated. It wouldn't last, and Antolio was sure of it. There was a limit to what people could take of oppression and exploitation. Resistance, of often sporadic and ineffectual, had been begun during the invasion and hadn't stopped since. They lurked beneath the eyes of their oppressors, by bidding their time till the right opportunity presented itself. It was his job to coordinate the movement of supplies, ensure the partisan bands possessed enough weapons, munitions, and foods that last through another day, another week, and another month. That the tenuous lines of supply maintained through sympathizers and smugglers from which food, parts, and bullets flowed are kept open in the face of German crackdowns and pacification operations. One day the Ukrainian people would rise against their yoke of their fascist oppressors, break the chains of tyranny, and take their rightful place among their fraternal socialist brethren. All you could do was make sure that they were prepared when that day came. The cause endures. The national issue. How many more days do we have for this? Ten, 21. The door to the cottage opened with a painful squeak. First Secretary Ochitsky had requested the hinges be replaced, but Chairman Chimsky had vetoed the suggestion. The screech would warn them of any unexpected guests. Standing above a wooden table, the old farmer stirred a large bowl of borscht. He looked up at Chimsky with a kind smile and poured two metal mugs. I do not wish to speak out of turn, Chairman, but even the party leadership needs to eat every once in a while. The old man said in a deep Russian accent. Chimsky nodded gratefully and took the two mugs down into the cellar. Ochitsky sat in the corner, a can illuminating the numerous documents placed in front of him. Shumsky placed the borscht next to another cold, half-finished mug and joined his first comrade on the dusty floor. Does it ever concern you, First Secretary? That the soldiers of the Ukrainian Revolution can hardly speak the language, Shumsky said, watery borscht dripping from his mustache. I do not try to concern myself with such matters, Chairman, as we are all workers and we can all understand, understand each other well enough. Lechitsky responded, his eyes not leaving the papers, and yet we cannot deny that our current struggle is one of both class and nationality. When victory is achieved, we will have a state to call home while the Russians only have, only have a wasteland. It seems to me that they should be brought into the fold, taught the language, and welcomed with open arms. As was done in the 30s, it's a nice thought, but people rarely share their culture so easily. It may very well be more trouble than it's worth, Shumsky thought about this for a moment. The working class of a single united party in a shared struggle. It's necessary that we should be able to win with one voice. Your logic is sound, comrade. Let the Russians speak whatever tongue they wish. I, I just want to do this one. Just because, go big or go home. Blind the monstrosity. So if you want to read about Eradicate uh, Klychevsky's agents, please go ahead. Yeah, because it gives us not as much control. Among the casualties and slaughter we endured in the West Russian War was almost all of our presence on the right bank of the Ukraine from Kiev to Mykolaiv. We cannot allow the Germans to continue their unoppressed, unopposed campaign of oppression and terror. We must harass the enemy monster at every turn, which means we must bring the fight to the administration's doorsteps. Our objectives are here in uh, threefold. Establishing an armed presence in the area. 
spreading your message in recruitment campaigns, and collecting the intelligence on the enemy's activities. These efforts will be a key and are keys to Kiev once the hour of insurrection is upon us. And shit, the Tomir. It's all the way over here, there's no point. This would be better, but we're working on this area too, right now. The presence. Um, Vesvil Olad, Holobnichi, open the manila floor, delivered by a covered partisan who looked far too young. He looked through like its contents with a trained eye, stood at the nexus of an intelligence network that stood across the western Ukraine. The informants collected information from Germans on leave from those with loose lips, but listened by alcohol or companionship, and noted true movements, vehicles, and bases. He looked back at his desk, examined the map of Ukraine which sprawled over it. He'd been with him for years, constantly being updated the positions of Germans and Ukrainians alike in something extra. Marks of damaged railroads, broken dams, destroyed hospitals and schools. Neither the war nor the Germans had been able kind to of Ukraine. He had been a plan for that. Drafts of an economic reconstruction to rebuild his country, a glimpse of the future which might not come, one that he might not live to see. It was a sobering thought. But it was a future. He set about dra drafting new orders, allocating food and munitions. This would be time for the future later. The presence comes first. Because for this one, Hugens will get even more control, which is good. Blind monstrosity. Yeah, there's no point to do this one because it's just so far away from us. And over here, at least, I mean, we don't benefit that much. But we will not die a slave, and the revolution endured. The fascists have done everything they could to snuff out the flame of the socialist liberation in Ukraine. The process they pursued with reckless, relentless cruelty, but their efforts have been for naught. The spirit of resistance of the 50s has returned with a vengeance, but beneath the suit of tyranny that chokes out the people. Blackens the factories and ravages of fields are the same ideas and hopes of for freedom and justice that led us to victory in 1917. Freedom, true emancipatory freedom for labor and present. the peasant is coming. Comrades, a liberation from the Germans and the bourgeoisie man or God is coming. Lenin is young again, and so is the revolution. Why we fight, you know? All right, it's that time again. Let's save it up. We got goals: a free communist Ukraine. Nice, twenty-five percent. Ooh, morbid matrimony. Someone in Ukraine. There's a scrapbook statuing some old home in Donetsk. But well, love judging by the uh, dog-eared pages and straining spine, but gathering dust nonetheless. Within were a handful of grainy photos commemorating a day of celebration and time of violence and strife. These three brothers were covering the crumbling old walls of a ruined church with a fresh coat of paint to hide their age. The floorboards were rotten from the water damage or coming loose, a problem being remi remedied by fourth man with hammer and hope. Where one to look closely, they would see the youngest brother's left hand was missing a finger, the oldest brother was missing an eye. The church was much cleaner in the next, although uh, in one of the stained glass windows was a bullet hole not present in the previous image, carpet covered. The dubious flooring and the fresh paint stood out gloriously, even in black and white. One armed man was using his good limb to escort a young woman down the aisle. They both bore a resemblance to three brothers, and their curly hair and dimpled smiles. A beaming young man and a stoic priest awaited them. The next was in another room, where champagne flowed and gathered guests wore significantly dumber grins than before. With ties loosened and collars of buttons, they danced. Most had someone on their arm, save for an older woman awkwardly tucked into the corner, thumbing a ring on her finger. The next few photos were the same, a happy scene of joyful guests with something distractingly off, a shattered glass not picked up, war wounds on every other person, or bloodstains that just wouldn't come out of the suits and dresses. The penultimate photo was almost exactly the same. Only the bride had planned her foot through the rotting floorboard, just looking at the photo one could imagine this shock silence before they all turned to the next page to see the entire living room, or the entire room laughing, bright and all. Where were they now? Hero of the Union, men in training. Why should she be made a general? Propaganda value, almost certainly. Ludmila Pavlichenko thought bitterly. A fellow revolutionaries he needed a beacon, a mascot. But it was the same morale. They needed someone more inspiring than the obscure bureaucrats and the decaying partisans that kept the movement functioning. While she had proven herself an effective killer, uh, perhaps the most effective butcher of Nazis since Stalin or Bukharin squirt watched or walked the earth, she had no pretensions of possessing any ability to lead. This is why she pushed herself to try harder than her comrades. Moo, she screamed as, as would-be soldiers pushed her way through the trees and foliage of the Ukrainian wilderness. Was a general meant to oversee training in this way? She didn't know, but she wasn't about to find out later and that she had failed her duties. She stiffly pointed her injured arm to a series of boards marked with a spray painted X. Fire. There was a series of percussive explosives, explosions as the boards splintered and smoke filled the air. Though she would not admit to anybody, the sight of her recruits doing so well filled with a sense of pride. They all made her hopeful that she had done something to offer the world after all, that she could be more than just a sniper. Even if she lacked the training and privilege of credentials of others, perhaps she could prove uh, herself to be a leader. There might be a life for her beyond these daily battles. For now, though, she pushed the thoughts from her head. There was so much work to be done. She would ensure they made history of the gates of Kiev a stronger little every other day. Or every day, really. Love being a bandit. Blind monster. Cryo cryptographic orders. 
in the front of the room of an innocuous little village hut. Maxim Sergeyevich Gornichuk sipped a cup of disgusting coffee and read the letter in front of him. The letter was from Shumsky, though the only way to know that was a tiny ink blot in the corner of the envelope was only visible to her trained eye. Secrecy, of course, was paramount. When her the communication could strangle the UA, SSR, in the cradle. Patience necessary. Move no more than necessary. You will know when it time. When it, you don't know when it is time. Maxim chewed his up and set the, down the cup. Brief as always from Shumsky, one of the many skills you learn while operating a partisan movement for decades. The plan was solid too, lay low. Conserve strength. Make only just enough to attack for the garrison to not suspect anything. Then, when the time was right, Shumsky would give the signal and now all cells would rise at once. But for now, Maxim needed to make sure this letter got to the next cell. A careful not to disturb the all-important inkblot, he knocked on the front door of the hut. So the letter underneath it, finishing off the vile Aristotle's coffee, he slipped out of the back door of the hut and vanished into the night. Discipline and discretion. Our target collaborators. Ooh. Revolution enduring, of course. And her absence. When the radius crackled to life and the sounds of gunfire merged, brave communards were emerging in the west. Now, this is all nice and all, but we can. Volnian, it won't really matter too much. Lessons of the Long March. To make mistakes as human, let us not make them again. Well, we're going to get this new option, so crack the apparatus. We are in insurgency, and as with every insurgency, we must take action against the oppressive apparatus under which we are supposedly governed. And we are therefore most fortunate that the Rax Commissaria, weak and corrupt as it is, offers us many ways in which we can do so. For the countless thoughts of loyal collaborators that, are, that it relies upon, to the widely scattered and insufficiently protected settlements, uh, to the endless miles of countryside and railway lines, opportunities abound. Every pillar that the state stands upon is vulnerable, and we will strike them all. As we should. Happy December, everybody. And we will not die a slave. God, I love drinking. Crack. Oh. Compromise of the auxiliaries. The Germans are under the deadly delusion that they can rule Ukraine all by themselves. Even as uh, they marshal legions of desperate collaborators against their tyranny, the Germans sneer and dismiss these men. Without them, the German uh, hold in Ukraine will collapse overnight, making infiltrating the ranks all the more vital. Fortunately for us, the Reich's efforts to inspire loyalty and ideological fervor, often with heavy handed propaganda and historical exhortations about Judeo Bolshevik world orders and famines, generate more eye rolls and concealing yawns among the traitors than anything else. Simple fact is that these men serve the Reich's commissariat out of survival. Not out of devotion, and for every day that the Reich grows sicker, they grow more disloyal. Some of us may feel indignant about recruiting these men, but among the traitors and are men who know, deep down, that to serve the Shuma, or UNA, is a fight for the rape of Ukraine, and to serve the Red Army is to save it, of course. What was this? Assumption cycle ending. Oh. Oh no. Very nice. Yeah, there you go. Nice. 35%. We're getting better. I'll not die a slave. Bilbib gritted his teeth as the gunfire raged around him. He didn't dare risk picking his head out, as he was pinned down with sustained gunfire with the Germans. Everything was going wrong, and they were on the verge of being surrounded. Worse, he was cut off from his little battle group, most of whom were behind the truck they'd arrived on or on the other side of the street. None of them could communicate with each other, not unless they were grouped, and to do so right now would be suicide. They needed covering fire, but they had no one coming. Something had to be done, if no one acted, they'd be killed for sure. He took a deep breath, clutching his rifle tightly. They might as well be him. He sprang up after one volley finished and aimed his rifle in the general direction of the Germans and opened fire while dashing towards a nearby alley. The German response was immediate, even though as they were forced to take cover. In the empty alleyway, he leaned against the wall, panting as he felt something wet and warm running down his arm. He put his fingers to it and he was surprised when they came back red. Crap. He risked firing a few more suppressive bursts from his position to keep the Germans away, while he pulled out his bandages before the wounded wound worsened. He was wounded, but his position was better now. More gunfire sounded and realized it was coming from the other side of the street. Pilp. Smelled widely saw the other half of his battle group pushing forward even without him. He quickly added a suppressive fire to the mix, and it was now the Germans who were on the defensive. That was a bad start, but they seemed that they turned it around. If they were making progress here, you can only imagine how the rest of the uprising across the east must be going. If things went well, this was the beginning of the end of the Reich. We'll see. We have 18 days, so basically sometime in January. Hey, 11% is not bad. Full control. There's a sliver of influence here. We have 1.2%, so basically like a guy and his dog. 85% is pretty good, though. Why we fight? Watch out, broken bottle, warned Petro, causing old Lena to nearly trip as she stepped over without looking and jammed her foot into the raised cobblestone. Petro was quick to pull her back before she fell, stifling her laughter. The sun was glowing. Just from above the monotonously uniform skyline of cheap housing, only broken by the natural signs of urban decay, lonely construction cranes, shattered windows on every floor, and faded graffiti. Heck of a honeymoon, muttered Olena. Petro's cheerful expression melted into a frown. Come on, darling. We still have a few days. You know what's at stake. If we don't fight, we. I understand it's just hard, her expression brightened a little bit. She looked over to a patch of trees, giving shade to a patch of grassy lawn. Hey, a park. That graveyard, although I guess anywhere with trees in this godforsaken city is a park, replied Petrol, as I sat on a bench. 
It would seem as they weren't the only ones who decided the line was blurry enough, just as they sat down through children ran past. One child was chasing the others, ch cackling madly as the rest screamed and mocked terror. It's like they don't even know, smiled Leno. Petro nodded, although he was staring beyond at where the grave sites were loosely arranged. There was a young man kneeling before three headstones, each bearing the same surname. His eyes were filled with tears, but there was a look of determination or even anger on his face. Petro had seen his eyes a thousand times before. These were the eyes of someone who had lost everything to the fascists. Petro squeezed Olen's hand and was glad he was fought for a different reason. We'll make it. Consumption cycle. If you know about this, please go ahead. Oh, there you go. And understood. Hey, we get more political power. We lose a crap ton of stability and more war support, but whatever. Local grain needs are not met. The Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic gets more stability, war support, and manpower. Our resistance status in every region goes up by 4.5% to the Ukrainian Red Army. And desolation goes up too. But look at that, Germania's de uh, development expectations are met. So, they expect more, doesn't matter. We get more, slightly more growth. Oh, a decrease in grain output has been recorded across the regions due to the resistance levels of each region. The national spirit name and the consumption cycle will be obtained for the following effects. Fantastic. So I read this one earlier. Drain the stockpiles. And best case scenario, we can quickly topple the Rocks Commissariat and liberate the people, without fears of a, protected, a protracted struggle. However, it would be foolish to dismiss the possibility that the fighting may be extensive and time-consuming. Such a situation would leave us at a disadvantage. Our weapon and munition stockpiles are limited and largely outdated, while the German armies are vast and cutting edge. Uh, that said, we can hit two birds with one stone to resolve the situation. Uh, our contacts and moles within the collaborators can access the enemy's equipment and lose them by accident for us. This won't fix a lot of equipment issues and will surely be a drop in the bucket for the Germans, but hey, every gun counts. Blood sacrifice. The cold wind carried Artyom's body back and forth like a rocking horse. When he filled his coat full of barley to bring to the partisans, he imagined the start of his career as a new pelotura, a career cut short by a Wehrmacht patrol. His new career is that of a warning strung up outside of his village with a sign printed to his chest I was caught aiding bandits. Artyom's friends passed by his corpse several times, each with an increased level of disgust. Some of them leaned, learned their lesson. Just not the lesson that the Germans intended them to learn as a sober discussion back at Konstantin's hovel would reveal. It was not enough for those brutes to take away our friend that they had per to parade his corpse in her face. Mietka's uh, mournful tone flipped into one of rising furies that stood around the room. Artyom's death must not be in vain, his mantle must be ours. Become ours, with that he will be avenged. There was no great echoing cheer from the room, just a scattering of fists in the air mixed with murmurs of skepticism. Why should they follow Artyom to the rope? This is insanity, must I tell you what I told Artyom before. Konstantin stones that of a teacher lecturing a disobedient student. Life isn't great, but it could always be worse. Mietka and the rest of Artyom's new admirers were furious. That is no lie, but it's an extended prelude to our creeping deaths. You may spend your days here drinking yourself to death, but some of us recognize a duty we've not just our team, but our nation. Each man remain resolute to either keep their heads down or pursue something greater. Life springs from death. Hey, get three plus three manpower. Look at that. Hello. Ah. Nice. Hey, if we can end this episode with getting two regions under our control, that'd be fantastic. Ah, hey, fifty fifty, nice. Now that is fantastic. Uh, false tranquility, and large cell presence. Terror. I kind of want to do terror. So if you do this, please go ahead. During the normal course of bourgeois society and its disease mode of civilization, terror against those who would fight for its continuation is both justified and necessary. Then how must we can act in confrontation with the Drax Commissariat for the past two decades? The Germans have done nothing but butcher our people, burn our fields, and deface our cities, all to leach every drop of blood from the Ukrainian land and people, and made no pretense of any other purpose. No punishment can be considered sufficiently harsh for anyone who would give their life to defend such a reality. Here are the Union voice of the people. I surely get back out of the field, General... Ludmila Palevchenko said, even as she sat herself in the chair in front of the radio microphone and prepared remarks, a brief scan revealed no shortage of cloying cliches and self pitying cries. Of course, of course, said a man in a frame, dress uniform. And we want you out there doing what you do best, which is why the Red Army keeps forcing me to read. No one's forcing you to do anything. No one would dream, God, Ludmila. You were brought here out here as a sign of respect. You were the Union's best advocate 20 years ago. There's a reason Bukharin had you tour in the United States and Canada too. He gestured his arms in a wild, childlike manner as a capture of the nature of her one-time tour, meeting Eleanor Roosevelt, being denied by President Dewey and his priggish controller Robert Taft, speaking in packed concert halls. What good had the trip done to so many years ago when she played along and allowed others to dictate her remarks? What did she get to achieve when she allowed the cow-eyed American press to ask her about her makeup routine on the front line, her face turned red? I'm not a shot. I'm a veteran of the Great Patriotic War. I'm a general of the Red Army. I've killed 849 fascist invaders, spat Lud Ludmilla. If you want my voice, my own words need to be behind it. That's the only way I can reach the right people. 
There was a pause. The man gave an exasperated sigh, left the room, then returned with a pen. With a pleased grin, Ludmilla stretched her arms, st stiff arm and began to rewrite her speech. Workers of the world, my name is General Ludmilla Pavlichenko. I come to you as we approach the hour of our liberation. Uh, ensure force regularity. 10% bonus to both division organization max planning. Exchange for increased division training time and supply consumption. Huh. Limited command decentralization. The beginning of combined arms. The 1950s were dark days in Ukraine. Our union had delivered us from the oppression of the Russian Tsar and fallen, replacing it with the brutal and relentless boosts of the Teuton. Ukraine did not take its oppression lightly and immediately took up arms as directed by what remained of the old authorities. Many Ukrainians fell in the fight, it seemed hopeless, and yet hope emerged once more from the east, so that army again surged and distracted the occupiers long enough for the Ukraine to finally realize it was long sought after freedom. But alas, it was not to be. If we tell we won against the superior German arms, we would, in our liberated territories, be mercilessly attacked and our fighters annihilated. We were immature and experienced young fools, desperate for freedom, yet without the means to achieve it. It is different now, though. We have changed and we have learned. Our men have cut their teeth against the Germans for long enough to make it a science. We have antagonized or agonized over our mistakes enough to say where we went wrong and never do these things again. We shall liberate and hold Ukraine without our passing mistakes. But I think we'll end it there. Our stability and worst part looking pretty good for what we want. So, hey, if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as Ukraine is probably going to explode some more. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.